If you're wondering if you are C-band ready for 5G, you are in the right place. Today, we are going to talk about things like how the 5G repack will affect your signal service, uh, why it's important to install new equipment sooner than later, and the next steps that you can take to be sure you're C-band ready for the 5G C-band frequency relocation. And then uh, at the end, we're going to have some Q&A time. So if you have any questions at all, please drop them in the chat box here, and we will do our best to address them at the end. And if for some reason we can't get to them all, we will get back to you, or you can contact us. We're, we're here for you, so we want to hear from you. My name is Jill Sorgi, and who I have here today with me is Gene Sorgi and Bob Cato. Hey, guys. Hey, how's it going, Jill? Hi, Jill. Thank you, you guys. You're such great sports, and I'm thanking you so much for being here today with us. So I am just going to go ahead and get started. So in its 20-22 report and order, the FCC established procedures to relocate existing operations into the upper part of the C-band spectrum. So Bob, can you please just kind of give us a quick summary of the C-band relocation and the deadlines that we need to know? All right, so the FCC has established a timeline for us to transition off from the lower C-band portion to the upper 200 megahertz. Uh, we're gonna do that in two phases. Uh, first phase is ha has to be completed by December 5th of this year. The antenna companies that are, that are program companies that are receiving services right now, they will need to either repoint antennas or move to different frequencies, whatever is required in order to get them into the 200 megahertz range. Our first deadline, as I said, is December 5th of 2021. That'll complete the first phase of this transition. Excellent. So, Bob, what happens if a C-band user does not take action uh, by these deadline dates? Well, the program service providers that they're using currently are going to be uh, moving to different satellites, moving to a different frequency if they're not above the uh, 400 megahertz range. Uh, they'll all need to be able to move and coordinate programming to continue the getting their revenue that they've been getting in the past. If they don't move, if they don't do anything, they're going to lose their services, they're going to lose their programming. Gotcha. Now, um, along with, you know, these technical questions that we're talking about, you had mentioned to me about something called dual illumination, and I found that kind of interesting. Um, can you share some more uh, about that with our viewers today? So the, the dual illumination process will be uh, programmers that have to move either to another frequency, another satellite, uh, whatever the, the need is for them to be able to continue getting and providing programming they'll more than likely be providing dual illumination. The dual illumination allows them to continue with the original programming that the customer's used to getting. Plus, they'll be able to illuminate on a secondary frequency or a secondary satellite, which will allow the customer time to get their equipment in place, to get their programming all taken care of, and get a smooth transition from the current frequency that they're on to the new frequencies. Okay. Is there any kind of deadline uh, or dates associated with dual illumination that you know about? Dual illumination will be will depend on the service of the provider. Uh, some people won't need much because the equipment can be automated to the point where all it has to do is change to another frequency on the current satellite that it's on. Others will need more time because new equipment will have to be installed, uh, additional filtering, feeds, LNBs, everything that's needed to get the new service running on a new satellite, and that'll take much more time. So dual illumination will take, will be varied throughout the field as to how long it runs. If you're any concern at all, you need to try to get with your program service provider and find out what they're going to do for dual illumination or how they're going to help you with your transition. Okay, got it. So 
our most important things so far are those dates and also that you have to have the proper ground equipment installed. So Jean, I'd like to ask you that question. Um, what is the proper equipment, the proper ground equipment uh, that is well, I'm required? Glad you, I'm glad you asked that question, Jill. The proper equipment is gonna require feeds, LMBs, filters, and the right size antenna because size does matter. Oh, gotcha, size <laughs> does matter. So, well, that works out well for Challenger because we are constantly building 3.8 meter and 4.5 meter antennas. And we do offer 6.3 and 7.5 meter antennas for those who are farther away from the orbital slot that they need, like, uh, for example, Alaska and Hawaii. And uh, if you check out our website, it's cbandready.com. Uh, you can see a lot more about our dishes, the sizes, feeds, filters, all sorts of things like that. So definitely check that out. Um, and then another question, Jean, um, does the material that the dish is made of matter? Yes, I believe that in my experience over the last 30 years of stamping reflectors, a metal dish has a higher gain than an SMC product. Got it. So um, for those of you listening, and watching. Uh, Challenger has prepared a checklist for C-band users so they can determine if they have the proper equipment already. Um, those watching now, it'll be sent via email when the webinar is over and we have a follow-up email. Um, anyone else watching this anytime um, on YouTube or anything like that, uh, just contact us, email us, call us. We'll get that checklist over to you, answer any questions that you might have. So, I want to get back a little bit to those important dates that Bob had mentioned earlier. So he had said, um, and these are the important dates that really we all need to know about. So December 5th, 2021 is what you mentioned. That's the phase one accelerated location deadline. And then the second date is December 5th, 2023, which is the phase two accelerated relocation deadline. So. Gene, why are these dates uh, so important? Well, lead time for receiving and installing equipment um, due to COVID, the lead times are much longer. Uh, material costs have increased, uh, aluminum, steel, epoxy, trading materials, uh, large increase of pricing over the last 12 months. Yeah, no doubt. So we've definitely seen that. Just the cost of lumber alone is insane. I and mean, we got to build those dish crates um, along with the aluminum and steel. We've been seeing it firsthand. So definitely the sooner the better, place your orders. Um, hey, Bob, what is another reason to get equipment on order right away? Well, your, your technicians need to be deployed so that they can get out to the sites all across the country, help you with your repoints, your feed installs, LNBs, filters, whatever's required to make sure that your services don't drop off. So in order to be able to, to go ahead and schedule all these people, we need to get the orders in as soon as possible. Um, whether it's just a, a simple repoint, you need a qualified technician to help you. We're seeing all kinds of things that are popping up all across the board. Um, changes in antenna sizes are required in some, some instances. Uh, there's lots of things that have to be taken care of before this December 5th deadline. Gotcha. So very important sooner than later, don't procrastinate. And so due to that accelerated schedule, uh, Challenger will turn quotes on full packages or individual items uh, as quickly as possible. Just reach out to us. We're here for you. And uh, speaking of our customers and everyone out there, um, we hear the term incumbent uh, frequently when we're discussing the CBAN repack, um, reading articles, I see incumbent. So incumbent earth station operators is something I see a lot. Um, so Bob, what are the different types of customers that we're working with here? So incumbents are the folks that registered their uh, CBAN downlink sites and uplink sites, whatever, during the 2018 initial um, sign up for the the repack there's uh, four four different low types of um, uh, categories involved in this 
uh, first category of the people that uh, incumbents that are going to go ahead and take the lump sum buyout. Uh, they will actually have submitted their paperwork this last fall to go ahead and take the lump sum. Uh, yes, they're still waiting on checks. The clearinghouse still hasn't had the money that uh, needed to dis distribute to them, but they're working on it and it should be soon. Uh, the second type of uh, a group that is going to go ahead and be proactive that are incumbents that have registered, uh, these folks will actually be the people that um, go out and grab the bull by the horns. They're going to go ahead and get their own feeds or LMBs, filters, whatever antennas that they need in order to repoint to the services. So they're prepared to do this transition quickly and smoothly. They will then actually go back to the clearinghouse with the bills that they've, uh, you know, money that they've expended or whatever. They'll go back to the clearinghouse and request a reimbursement. The third group of people, which are the folks that uh, we're seeing right now, um, those folks are the satellite owners and program providers that are actually sending out people. And currently there's several different companies out in the field that are doing the uh, installations, uh, repoints, feed work, whatever. Uh, and USSI is one of those companies. ATCI is actually doing all the simulsat work now and Pacific Cable's out there in the field. These, uh, these folks will have um, their programming needs taken care of directly by the S SES, Intelsat, Utilsat, whoever it is that they're getting their programming from. The fourth group of people, those people are the ones that did not register in the 2018 sign up time. Uh, they are, we're understanding at this point, there are hundreds and hundreds of radio stations, small cable companies, uh, backyard dish owners, whatever. These folks are going to have to just take the, the bull by the horns themselves. They'll have to buy their own LMBs, buy their own feeds, their own antennas. There will be no re reimbursement for these folks. Great. Gotcha. So, Definitely for those people, we're, we're here to help you and actually all of the customers, um, you know, if you are looking to purchase and do reimbursement or if there's just something that you need, please give us a call. We'll definitely help you out. And then also um, in the chat, if it's not there yet, we'll put a link in there for uh, the RPC. That's the Relocation Payment Clearinghouse. Um, that'll give you more information on who that is and what they're doing. And then... Um, Bob, um, you brought something up that I'm glad you brought up. Uh, you had brought up the service providers. So, uh, for example, when SES learned of this webinar, uh, they contacted me and asked if we would share the following uh, with our viewers. They said, please inform the attendees that vendors from USSI, ATCI, and Pacific Cable will be reaching out on behalf of SES to schedule filter installation for the 5G C-band transition. Um, they said that service providers need cable affiliates to answer their phones when the vendors are calling so that they can uh, schedule those installations at their earth stations. So uh, if you are one of these people out there and you've got your service provider calling you, please make sure you pick up your phone and take that call. Uh, if they're leaving you a message, make sure you get them a call back because they're basically scheduling to get that equipment to you at no cost and time is of the essence because they're gonna book up fast and that's gonna push you out further if you wait. So um, Bob and Jean, um, we've been getting some, this is some great information today. I, I hope everybody is finding it as interesting as I am and I hope it's really helpful. Um, we do have some time to answer questions from people out there. Uh, if anybody's got any just yet, yeah, I'm gonna, Take a peek in the chat, see what we got. And I also have, let's see. So I do have a question here. Um, I think this is a good one for Jean. Uh, why is metal better than SMC? You must be referring to antennas. Go, yeah. Why is metal best better than SMC? Jean, go ahead. Well, the metal reflector is the good RF uh, bounce to your feed. An SMC reflector without embedding a mesh or putting on a copper or nickel based paint 
would have zero bounce back. So I feel that that's one of the best reasons. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that makes really good sense uh, with the metal surface. And then, uh, you know, another factor, I think just these, these metal antennas really are stronger and more rigid. Um, just for example, we have an installer who is in Iowa and it was just last year, Iowa had some really intense uh, straight winds come through. And I know a particular site, uh, this customer went, um, I'm sorry, the installer went to see the customer. So after the storm, there was a SMC antenna and it was next to a Challenger antenna. After that storm came through, it just completely destroyed the SMC antenna, but the Challenger was fine and still standing. So I think that's another great benefit uh, to why metal is better than SMC. Um, so another question here I have. So, oh, okay. This says, is the deadline December 2025 or 2023? So um, Bob, maybe you can answer that one. So the, the final days of the accelerated program for the second phase is December of 2023. The FCC has built in a little cushion there just in case, and that final deadline is in 2025. What they're attempting to do is get all this completed in a timely manner, making sure that you keep your program services, you keep your customers happy, and by doing the, first, the, the second phase and getting it done in 2023, that still allows for your programming, but it gives us a little cushion just in case things go awry and we have to fall back and start with another plan by the FCC in order to get things done. The cutoff deadline, the final day is December of 2025. No matter what happens by that, before that date, after that date, we will have to make sure that we have all of our programming needs taken care of in the C-band because 5G will come in or the, the providers that are going to be picking up services for your cell phone will be cutting your, your services off if you're not prepared and not done by that date. Excellent. Okay. That's good to know. Um, now, I got some other activity coming in here, so don't want to look distracted. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, Facebooking, I swear. <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, this question is about, um, you know, we talked about how important size is and that size matters. And we talked about, you know, 3.8 meter and up. Um, so someone's asking why, uh, why was, why would a smaller dish not really be acceptable? Um, maybe Bob, maybe you could tell us a little bit. Yeah, more. over the, over the years, we found that, uh, the reflective surface that are on the antennas and the smaller antennas, um, you have a lot more compression ratio now than you did in the past. Digital frequencies are much more susceptible to losses and things along that line. Um, several years ago, the radio industry uh, put out a, a notice throughout the industry that 3.8 meter or larger was almost a requirement in order to keep good, strong um, C-band service to your radio station. And that's, this has been several years ago. So the larger the antenna is, the more surface gain that you have, the better you're gonna, your signals are gonna be. You're just overall doing yourself a favor by installing a good antenna that's more than you need because when the weather's terrible outside, you don't wanna be out there shoveling snow out of this thing or you know rain off of it or whatever you need to do in order to keep your signal up. Buy a bigger antenna, it will allow you to have more margin so that when weather's bad, you can still have service. Excellent. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure a lot of people were wondering. Um, another question here. I have, um, okay, so I have, uh, well, someone was asking, can Challenger offer installations? Yeah, uh, Challenger has installation companies that they, we work with. We have a uh, bean, Patriot initially, and now the Challenger name, we have been in the field and in, in the industry for years and years and years. We have qualified people we've worked with. We know all the, the people that are installing antennas, the qualified technicians, the experts in the field, if you will. 
Um, we can do installations. We can help you with installations. Uh, we can put you in touch with the right installer if that's what you need. But you're going to have to reach out to us. Let us know. Otherwise, we can't help you. Definitely. Appreciate that, Bob. And then, um, yes, so let us know. That's We can help you get your right equipment. And uh, OK, I have, uh, let's see. I know we're. We're getting, uh, we've been running about 23 minutes. That's great. The, uh, I don't want to keep you guys on too long. I know everybody's got stuff to do. Maybe getting hungry for lunch. Uh, quick question right here. Um, oh, uh, can we replace parts? Uh, I'm sorry, where did it go? Can Challenger provide replacement parts for old antennas in the field? Is that, uh, maybe Jean, maybe you can answer that one. Uh, they're asking about, uh, yeah, can, can Challenger provide replacement parts for old antennas in the field? Um, yes, well, possibly. Depending on the equipment, if it was an old Patriot antenna, most likely we would be able to help. Um, for sure, if it was a Challenger antenna, all these pieces that we build are interchangeable and, and, and can be replaced. So pictures would be very helpful, and mm -hmm. we would get back with you in a, a quick uh, Okay response. If you've got a slightly damaged antenna out there and the lawnmower guy hit it or a baseball hit it, the guy at the bar next door threw a beer bottle at it. <laughs> if you have a damaged antenna, send us a picture of it. We'll see if we can't get you the replacement part. These are all interchangeable. This is a good antenna. It's easy for you to just swap out a piece, put a new one in there and get your antenna back up running full strength again. Excellent. So yeah, and then just so our listeners, just so you know, we're referring to the, you know, the obviously Challenger now or the Legacy Patriot. Um, we are using the same tooling, so um, we can definitely help you out if that's your case. Um, definitely, the pictures are worth a thousand words because I have, uh, you know, we've been through this before. Someone asks us, we say send pictures of your dish. Sometimes we can help them. Sometimes maybe they're too far along. It's not something that we can help with, but that's always the best way to know. Um, I do have a question here. Actually, it's uh, someone is here with us from Europe. And so he has a question. Well, I'm going to ask you guys. I don't know if we'll have the answer, but I uh, definitely want to ask just in case. Otherwise, we'll research more. Um, I believe it's Sten. He's asking, will the C-band impact be the same in Europe as in the US? Uh, there is traditionally frequency differences. So I'm wondering if the impact is the same in Europe. Um, I don't, Bob, I hate to put my you research on. says that My research says that the Europeans are using a different frequency layout for their um, 5G. Um, I'm not an expert at that by any means. So um, we would have to go and do a little more research in order to give a, a good educated answer to that mm -hmm. question. Sorry. Nope, totally fine. I think that's great. And then we do have some, uh, we have connections and uh, resellers and integrators in Europe. So uh, I'm definitely going to reach out. Uh, reach out following this and, and learn more about that. Um, got a question here. Okay, so um, it's, it's okay. So this is a question. I'm just trying to see the names a little bit cut off of who it is, but uh, it says I've seen many filters and LMB filter combos, and I have heard of the three phases. Um, I've heard depending how far the 5G tower is. Is there one filter that will be a good one size fits all, or does it depend on tower locations, et cetera? Okay, so the tower location is gonna be a factor for you if you're getting just saturated with uh, ground level noise. The filter situation, what it boils down to is that the first phase filters will cut off an, uh, a certain amount of the C-band frequency, the very lower portion of it. And they're going to cut off up to uh, the 3.8 uh, frequency from below that. They're, they're not going to allow that signal through. The insertion loss of that filter is going to actually cause a little bit of signal degradation. So you're, you're going to find some, uh, some issues with maybe getting an up signal level, maybe not. The thing that you're going to look at is if your program is moved to above the 400 megahertz range, uh, then you, all you're going to need is a second second phase filter because your programming isn't down in that lower area that's going to have tra 
transition over next year. So if you if your programming's already moved above the 400, then go ahead and get a, uh, the second phase filter. Save yourself the cost of buying two sets of different filters. Um, as far as as uh, the tower on your antenna and such, that's going to be a, a per site uh, issue. And you probably will need a good technician to come in to give you advice and to look over the situation, see what can be done to help you make sure you keep your programming. Excellent. Bob, I really appreciate that. That actually, I realize now that came from uh, Roger. Roger is in Canada. He's a question, uh, customer of ours. So thank you for that question, Roger. I have another question here. Um, this is a good question. This is from Crystal. Um, the US DOD is a significant user of the commercial C-band. Is there a DOD plan for readiness with the C-band transition? That's a really good question. I don't know about that. Have you heard anything about that, Bob? I have not. Um, the DOD is, uh, um, they're sort of privileged in what they uh, use and what, uh, you know, what frequencies that they can get. So. I'm really not sure about that. And I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, uh, I'm just, you know, learning it, learning as we go. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, this part of the uh, transition, this is all new stuff. And we will have new issues crop up as we go through the transition. Um, if, you're, if you've been in the CBAN industry the last 40 years, you know what all the, the quirks and such are of it. Um, not to not to go off topic here, but you know the, the DoD is going to have their own issues, and and uh, you know we'll need to take a look at each one of those individual sites, see if we can help. Okay, great. That is that's awesome. I appreciate that, and didn't mean to put you on the spot, uh, but I think that's a really great question because that's something I hadn't even really thought about. It is um, a great question. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'll do some more research on that. If uh, you want to get back with me later on. I, I'm happy to do some additional research and see what I can figure out. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, and I think just kind of wrapping this up, I really appreciate everybody interacting, asking questions. We're, we're hitting the 30 minute mark, so um, I don't wanna keep any, everybody too long. Um, just a, uh, what, we had one more question about, um, oh, uh, can Challenger, uh, somebody in Minnesota uh, asking if we offer any kind of de-icing equipment. Absolutely. Uh, we have a couple of companies that we work for, uh, work with that can, uh, we can provide uh, either active uh, anti-icing systems, which are heat units. We can full, offer uh, full coverage or uh, lower portion coverage. Uh, we also uh, have available uh, snow covers. So if you're just in the need of keeping the snow down off the antenna, uh, you know, feel free to contact us and we can, uh, work with you to find out which is the best solution for you. Okay, excellent. So um, with that, I think uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. So I, again, just want to say thank you so much to Bob Cato and Jean Sorgi for their time today. I hope this was informative and helpful to everybody out there. Um, we're here to surprise, um, sorry, provide support. So please contact us and also, please come see us at the trade shows, uh, whether it's virtual or in real life, because we're definitely looking forward to getting back out there and seeing everybody. Uh, we plan on uh, exhibiting at the NAB show. It has a October date, um, and we just received our booth location. We're going to be out in the silver lot outside uh, at NAB, so great spot. Come and see us outside, spend some time with us. And then also we do uh, plan to attend the Satellite 2021 show. Uh, I believe that date just got, the date and location just got moved. Um, I believe that might be September. Uh, and then IBC is coming up too. So we'll see how that goes. If we can attend, we'd love to. Otherwise, uh, we'll, be, we'll be virtual. So everybody, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you all have a great day. See you, Jill. Take care, Jill.